been prepared in the kingdom of God for all who believe and receive the gracious invitations of God's love. As Jesus offers words of encouragement and hope and the offer of abundance, even a room in the Father's house. This is preparing the disciples for the events that would unfold, that they, like many of us today, couldn't quite fathom the breadth and the depth of what was being offered. Thomas openly admitted to not knowing what Jesus was saying. We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? A very pragmatic concern and question that he raises. I guess Thomas's access to his spiritual GPS wasn't operating at peak condition that day. Maybe it was a very different day. But for us, did we hear clearly what Thomas was actually asking? It's not about maps and locations. We don't know the way. How can we know how to get there? Jesus is opening their hearts and minds to the depth and the breadth of a relationship of trust and believing that they were that they still struggled to grasp. Jesus' claim is so far beyond any credible claim that anyone has made, and their Jewish upbringing was certainly not open to the jaw-dropping claim. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What Jesus just said in that short phrase, he is not saying, I am leading you towards the way, the truth, and the life. I'm, I'm sort of a guide for you. That's not what Jesus was saying. He said, I am. An emphatic statement. <clears throat> Where have we heard that in Scripture before? Well, certainly you would remember from the Old Testament in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 14, in which God gives his name. I am who I am. Tell them, I am sent you. Jesus is taking that ownership and he's offering it to the disciples of his time. In the Gospel of John, there are seven occurrences that have resulted in some of the titles for Jesus. And the uh, I'll just name them quickly. I am the bread of life. We recognize it in a communion service. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. Each time these passages are in Scripture, they refer us back to Exodus. God said, I am. Tell them, I am sent you. It is generally interpreted as a self-declaration by Jesus, identifying himself as God. Today we have the benefit of reading and knowing the fuller revelation of Scripture, and yet still many people question and even doubt, even in the church. But then Philip jumps in. One of the other disciples gathered with them that day. Perhaps to soften the emphatic nature that was being heard from Jesus' declaration. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Don't we try to do that so often? When something is it sounds like it might be contentious, oh, I'll be the peacemaker. I'll soften it a little bit. This was Philip. Just, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. But that wasn't going to smooth things over quite like he had hoped. Jesus just took things a whole deeper level. 
But it's the first part of the response to Philip and to us that is very poignant for us to hear today. <clears throat> Don't you know me, Philip? What would we do if that was spoken directly to us by Jesus? Don't you know me, Jesus? Uh, Philip? This is the crux of the discussion, both with the first disciples and today with all who claim to be believers. Don't you know me? It is first and foremost a relationship question and therefore foundational to our spiritual life in Jesus. If we do not know the who, what, where, when, and why of Jesus, what is it that we claim? Today, as we come to the table of the Lord, to re-enact, to remember, in the sense of being members again of God's family, to recommit our living, active, engaged relationship with Jesus, no compromise. There is a, an aspect of being invited to the table and we hear it in one way as human beings because we hear it from our struggling perspective. But Jesus says, come to the table. But then we say, so what's the conditions, Jesus? You mean I've got to commit my whole life to you if I'm going to come to the table? You mean I, I have to serve you in whatever way that you equip me to do it? And I have to do that regularly, insistently, without question? That's hard, Jesus. Is that the condition that I come to the table? Jesus says, come to the table. We might hold all of that, and a lot of that might have some validity to it, but it's because we need to think through and understand what it is that we are claiming and what we are choosing to live. It's us that puts that condition on it, not Jesus. But it is a condition that we need to be thoughtful about because we need to get our whole heart, mind, and spirit straightened out. Today, as we do come to the table, Jesus is waiting. Jesus is there for us. But it's not a compromise. We had a lively conversation this past week in our study. I won't go into names of people who talked and details of it. But that's the concept, the idea was so wonderful for us to talk about. And there were differences of opinions. But we were able to hear that. And we were able to think about that. And allow that to sit with us. And perhaps even cause us to think more deeply. That conversation was about the concept of compromise. Without naming anyone, we worked with the word concept of being politically engaged. Now while there is very real necessity for political engagement, I questioned whether Jesus was political. Was he politically motivated? I propose the idea that no, Jesus was not political. Politics is a mechanism to make decisions for the good of all as human beings. But when various parties take sides and it can lead to a stalemate, or at best a compromise, unsatisfactory but still agreed to in order for us to move forward. In light of what we have heard in Scripture today and reflected on, Jesus does not compromise. 
When his disciples raise questions or doubts, Jesus lays out the ramifications against compromise. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have done. Just as direct and plain and simple as that. What's the implication? If we do not believe, then we will do the things that we want to do, whether in line with Christ or not. But it doesn't end there. This is the, the, the beauty and the, the richness of what Jesus is inviting us to. I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have done, and they will do even greater things than these, that the Father may be glorified. So as people of faith, as Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, when we claim to believe in Jesus Christ, then we claim to follow in the ways that Jesus has prepared us, equipped us, and sent us to do. And so as we think about that, as we process that, as we hear, yes, we want to be engaged in the world around us, I was so happy to affirm this wonderful person in our midst that they are an advocate. Yes, they might do that advocacy in a political realm, but they're not political. They're an advocate for doing the right thing. That's what God is calling us to be. Advocates for doing the right thing. Not only that we tell others to do that, but that we do it ourselves. So, as we prepare to receive this gift, blessing to you, as you rise each and every day into the rich blessing of God's love and full provision. The table is prepared. The gifts of God for the people of God are ready. The invitation has been extended. All who seek to follow in the way of Jesus are welcome to offer our whole being for the kingdom of God and the blessing of God's grace to all who will receive it. So let us come to the table. just remind us, those that might be uh, here visiting or for the first time joining our communion, when the time comes, I'll call you to come forward and receive the piece of bread that will be given to you, and the cup is in the other um, container. Take a small cup and drink of it, and then place it on the silver tray and then return to your seat. For those of you who are not able easily to come forward or would rather me come to them, I will gladly do that. I will watch to see if hands go up, but also just uh, for those that are, I know that are not able easily to come, I will come and bring communion to you. So let us join in this great prayer of thanksgiving, the communion prayer. The Spirit of God be with you all. And Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Give thanks to God. All our thanks, all our praise. Holy God, Holy One, Holy Three. Outside all we know, you are God. After all is finished, you will be God. Archangels sound the trumpets, angels teach us their song, saints. Pull us into your presence. And this is our song that we speak together. Holy, holy, holy God, our life, our mercy, our might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Save us, we pray, you beyond all. Blessed is the one who comes in your name. Save us, we pray, you beyond all. 
Holy God, Holy One, Holy Three, You beyond the galaxies, You forming the leaves, You opening the flowers, You giving us Your image, Your smile on Sarah and Abraham, Your words through Deborah and Isaiah. Your flesh Jesus Healing, teaching, dying. Rising, inviting us all to the peace. And we turn in our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession, recognizing that it is not only us, but it's God's people around the world that gather at tables with the Lord this day. Holy One, God with us, we give you thanks for the promises Jesus gave to all his followers that in him we see your face. He has shown us the face of your mercy and compassion, so we thank you for understanding us better than we know ourselves. He has shown us the face of your peace and justice, so we thank you for calling us to make a difference in the world for his sake. Holy One, in Christ you show us the way that leads through the paths of service. We pray for those who feel lost or alone, those who live with anxiety or doubt, their own, or doubt their own value, and all who cannot imagine a purpose for themselves. Let us hold just a brief silence in prayer.